it's all right. I plan to punt all the questions to you anyway. So, all right. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to to be here in a different role now this morning. Um, it's been a great experience to to be one of your facilitators and get to know some of you. Um, as director of engagement, I'd also like to try and get a chance to connect with everybody um, during the course of the next uh, um, two weeks um, and to find ways to continue to connect with you after you leave this program. But today what I'm here to do is to talk about the evolution of the topic of gender as an issue within the security arena. So building on Uri's um, opening statements which explain kind of the concept of gender and how it um, affects lives and, and how it affects everyone, um, I like to look at it in a sort of structured context about looking at it through the lens of the United Nations and through US policy and through some other mechanisms. Um, gender matters in terms of security whether you are talking about military operations or policing, crafting a strategy to confront security challenges or resolving a conflict. Um, I mean, spoiler alert, it matters in pretty much everything you're doing. The, the framework that has often been used to address gender issues is something called the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda. And what this agenda is, is it's a global architecture that supports gender equality, that seeks to manage and resolve violent conflict, that underscores the costs of conflict for women and children, and that works to elevate women as decision makers in the security sector at the peace table and in the range of decisions that shape war and peace. And so I'll be talking about these issues as we go through this morning. But again, you're thinking about you know, relationships between men and women, how to manage and resolve conflict, the effects of conflict on women and on children in particular, um, and thinking about how women can be decision makers within all aspects of the spectrum of war and peace. This agenda is developed in the 20th century and its champions sought to translate it then from abstract policy, abstract theory, into actual policy. And they taught, tried to do this both at the United Nations and in individual countries. Um, it was manifest most directly in the United Nations um, Security Council Resolution 1325. This resolution was passed in 2000. And it was passed under the leadership of Namibia, which was chairing the council at the time. What this resolution is, makes it unique is it's the first resolution of its kind that spells out the impact of conflict on women. It calls for their involvement at every stage of peace processes. And it urges the mainstreaming of gender issues into the broader peace building work of the United Nations. So again, these same themes. The impact of conflict the need to involve uh, women in all stages in the peace process, and to be thinking about gender more broadly in issues of war, peace, and security. The language of the resolution was both really pathbreaking, it's the first of its kind, and it's cautious. It's a, you know, United Nations is a consensus organization and they were trying to bring people along. So it set the stage, but it didn't finish the job. The four pillars of this resolution are participation, protection, prevention, and relief and recovery. So participation, that calls for member states to, quote, ensure increased representation of women in all decision-making levels in national, regional, and international institutions, and mechanisms for the prevention, management, and resolution of conflict. So again, it's participation at every level, um, national, regional, international, and in the prevention, management, and resolution of conflict. The second pillar of the resolution is protection. So protection it emphasizes the idea that civilians, and especially women and children, make up the bulk of those affected by conflict. They are the people who are bearing the highest price in war. It, and in the idea of protection, it calls on all parties to armed conflict to take actions to protect women and girls from gender-based violence. The third pillar is prevention. Prevention underscores both the fundamental need to prevent conflict and the role that women can play in this process. It also calls for an end to impunity and for prosecution for crimes against humanity, including sexual violence. 
One note it makes in this is that in trying to resolve conflicts, you'll sometimes have an amnesty agreement with uh, the combatants. This resolution says you should try and, where possible, exclude these kinds of crimes from this amnesty agreement, that, that, they were, that you do not want to create impunity for rape, for sexual violence, for related crimes, um, in the name then of, of wiping them all away in an amnesty recognizing that that's not always possible to exclude it, but emphasizing it as a principle. Finally, relief and recovery. Relief and recovery recognizes the spectrum of conflict, that, it, that the effects of the conflict don't end that the day the bullets stop flying. This pillar takes into account refugees and displaced persons. Um, in the conflict, um, Coming out of South Sudan, for example, the vast majority of refugees are women and children. It calls for those working with populations, with refugees, with IDPs, to take into account the women of girls. And that's in everything from thinking about how you design an IDP camp, to think about safety, to think about where the latrines are, about are there lights at night, um, are women going to have to go out and collect firewood, kind of every aspect of life there. And similarly, it says if you are working on issues such as DDR, um, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. You need to think about gender. Um, what are the needs of female ex-combatants, for example? What are the needs of their children if they have them? What about, uh, or, or women who have been kidnapped or taken into account? Um, in uh, recent DDR efforts, they found, for example, it's often harder to integrate women and girls back into their communities than it is men and boys um, because they are received differently by their families. You've got to think about these things as you're working through the process. So UNSCR 1325 has been followed by further resolutions at the United Nations that seek to fill in the gaps that were left by this first resolution and that deepen the UN's commitment to the women, peace, and security agenda. But individual countries have also created action plans. In 2011, uh, President Obama released the first U.S. action plan. He called it a roadmap for how the U.S. would accelerate and institutionalize efforts across the U.S. government to advance women's participation in preventing conflict and keeping peace. Nineteen African countries and the African Union have also created their own action plans. These plans seek to integrate a gender responsive approach to diplomatic development and defense related work. The United States plan calls to improve the prospects for sustainable peace by promoting women's rights and roles. It also pledges its efforts to strengthen attempts to protect women and children from harm, exploitation, discrimination and abuse, and trafficking in persons. And Notably, again, to hold perpetrators accountable, this question of impunity, of trying to look at the rule of law in the context of gender. The U.S. Action Plan also commits the United States to promote women's roles in conflict prevention, improve conflict early warning and response systems through integrating gender perspectives, and invest in women and girls' health, education, and economic opportunities, because these things are related. The themes are, again, very common. It, the plan also talks about responding to the distinct needs of women and children in conflict-affected dis disasters and crises, including by providing safe, equitable access to humanitarian assistance. One of the core ideas behind these action plans in all of our countries is not just that they're a nice idea from a humanitarian perspective or from a women's rights perspective, although those things are important, but they're also creating these plans because they make good strategic sense. In the words of the U.S. plan from 2016, quote, deadly conflicts can be more effectively avoided and peace can be best forged and sustained when women become all become equal partners in all aspects of peace building and conflict prevention, when their lives are protected, their voices heard, and their perspectives taken into account. What this is saying is the US national security establishment has reviewed this issue and they're saying that this matters, that this is more effective strategy um, 
and that failing to do so will in fact inhibit our attempts to fulfill our own objectives. So this slide gives you three statistics and I'm going to walk through them. Um, the first two slide, two columns here are about peace processes. So the United Nations looked at over 30 peace processes between 1992 and 2011. And what this first column illustrates is that only 4% of the people who signed peace agreements were women. Second column says only 9% of the negotiators at the peace table were women. So if 91% of the negotiators are male, 96% of the signatories are male, there has been a missing dimension in those peace processes. One of the other missing dimensions is frankly lasting durable pieces. Um, the same research that looked at these questions also found that where, when women are involved in discussions, the peace process is much more likely to last over time. And there's a group called Inclusive Security, which has done a lot of research and extensive work on this. And they ask what it is it that makes processes which are more integrated for women, men and women lead to more successful resolution. And they said that one reason these processes become more successful is that the women who are involved, who are at the table, may raise different priorities. Or they may advocate for other groups who might be excluded from the talks. In Northern Ireland, for example, you had a long-standing conflict between Catholics and Protestants. Women who were at part of the, became part of the peace negotiations raised the question of integrated education, which nobody had talked about before. But think about it. You have a long-standing conflict that's gone on for generations. If you don't have the prospect of integrated education, of um, people going to school together, of getting to know each other as children, you have a much greater risk of that conflict continuing into the next generation. In another example from inclusive security, they looked at Darfur. And while that's still a pro um, very much a piece that is yet to be fully attained, in the process, that have been, women have been pushing for neglected provisions, for pieces of the discussions that would have been left off the table. And among the examples of those are basic safety issues for, um, for IDPs, for displaced people. Food security, really fundamental to everyone, but particularly to a mother who's raising her children. And gender-based violence. That if they don't bring these issues up in the negotiations, they aren't going to be addressed. And if women aren't there, then that piece of the conversation is silenced. So the third column is a very different statistic. It's an illustration of how many Boko Haram suicide bombers were women and children. And that's over 70%. These statistics are not directly related to one another. And, but they are part of a bigger picture that it's important to understand about the spectrum of peace and conflict. Now, I include this last statistic about Boko Haram with a real degree of caution, because there are a lot of complex issues here. A lot of these women and children were coerced. Um, some may have been true believers, but it's a very complicated subject. Additionally, children in conflict is really its own subject of its, uh, of its own discussion. Um, but what I did, I wanted to include it here because the Women, Peace, and Security agenda argues that we need to think about gender in all aspects of conflict. And if we don't consider gender in issues such as combating violent extremism, we're not going to succeed in our objectives. So I mentioned at the opening of my talk that gender mattered, and that matters whether it's in military operations or policing, in crafting a st strategic security ch challenges, uh, or in resolving a conflict. The security of every country in this room, that represented by every one of us, including my own, is influenced by issues of gender. If your country takes in refugees, there is a gender dimension to that. If there is human trafficking place, taking place in your country, and there is human trafficking taking place, there are issues of gender and security involved in that criminal enterprise. These are issues that face every one of us. If you're engaged or assisting with a disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, or DDR process, you need to think about gender. 
in the armed forces and the police services, there is a need for training in gender issues, but also for greater participation for women. As US forces have discovered, you cannot engage with a population if you are only engaging with its male representatives. So this brings me to the Women, Peace, and Security Act of 2017. This is a very new law. It was passed by Congress and signed by the President less than three weeks ago. This is a bipartisan piece of legislation. Democrats and Republicans work together to enact it. And what tells you a couple things. One is, as you're probably aware, there are the United States, like every country, faces a number of urgent pressing priorities. Two, this is a moment in history when it can be difficult for the two parties to work together. In spite of that, in spite of that difficult environment, in spite of all those pressing priorities, Congress said this is a law that needs to be passed. They worked together and they enacted it. This bill puts into law the requirement to continue creating a national security strategy. So to build on that action plan that I described, but now it's a requirement under law. It requires this strategy to promote the participation of women in conflict prevention, management, resolution, and recovery. So a lot of these same ideas. Prevention, management, resolution, and recovery. It also requires the Departments of Defense, State, and USAID to train our own personnel and to report to Congress on progress in implementing the elements of this bill. So you all represent a rising generation of leaders in the African security sector. That's why you're here. And we have a record number of women attending this program. And that's a terrific development. But this topic is not a women's issue. This is a human issue. Gender matters in one way or another in every field, in every unit, and in every conflict. And it's one way or another in every one of your jobs. So thanks very much for the chance to <laughs> talk about some of these issues. And I look forward to hearing from you. Um, I think one of the discussions you might want to take up in the discussion sections and thinking about this is we've been talking about national security strategies. Where would gender fit into those? So thanks very much.